This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello and welcome to You're Dead to Me, the Radio 4 comedy podcast that takes history seriously. My name is Greg Jenner. I'm a public historian, author and broadcaster and former chief nerd on the BBC comedy show Horrible Histories. And today we are off to ancient China to dig deep into one of the most astonishing archaeological discoveries of all time. The first emperor of China's tomb, guarded by his famous terracotta warriors. And to help me do that, I am joined by two very special guests. In History Corner, she's Professor of Modern Chinese History and Literature at Birkbeck, University of London, and specialises in the relationship between culture and modern Chinese nation-building. She's written countless academic publications and several books, including two prize-winning books on the Opium War and Maoism. It's the fantastic Professor Julia Lovell. Welcome, Julia. Thrilled to have you here. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. And in Comedy Corner, returning for his third tour of duty on You're Dead to Me, he's a fantastic comedian and actor who's gone global since last we had him on the show. Not only has he previously bossed it on Taskmaster, Live at the Apollo and Have I Got News For You, but he's got a hilarious stand-up special on Netflix. He's in Amy Schumer's new sitcom, Life and Beth. He's even written a funny book, Side Splitter, and he's been on Letterman recently. What a busy guy. But most importantly, you'll remember him from our Chinggis Khan and Borges episodes. It's Philly Philly Wang Wang. <laughs> Welcome back, <Yes>. Phil. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me back. Yes, don't forget the last Wang. It is very important. I'm so happy to be back on You're Dead to Me. Thank you. It's um, it's always a thrill, always a highlight. <laughs> All right. And last time out, we talked uh, a bit about your, your education at the Malaysian school system. You hadn't done that much global history. But I'm curious as to whether the first emperor of China, the Terracotta Warriors, may be something you do know about. Only sort of culturally speaking, because um, my father's Chinese Malaysian. And so there is an awareness of China and Chinese histories as sort of a kind of motherland. But we still don't know the history all that well, actually. So what Chinese Malaysians know about Chinese history is usually what they pick up in like the period dramas, the Chinese period dramas, oh, okay. um, of which there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. <laughs> They're always besieging a fortress. And uh, there's so many of those shows and they, they're very popular in Malaysia. But aside from that, no, I don't really know very much. All right. Well, by the end of the day, you will know plenty more because we have an expert uh, with us. So what do you know? This is the So What Do You Know, where I have a go at guessing what you, our lovely listener, knows about our subject. And, well, the Terracotta Warriors have a pretty good name recognition, I think. Not least because a few of them have gone on tour recently. Uh, Indeed, they were hanging out in Liverpool. But in terms of pop culture, if you're a Terry Pratchett fan, you may remember that in one of his uh, Discworld novels, the protagonist Rincewind not only discovers a terracotta army in an imperial tomb, but also uses some VR technology to go and control it, which is very nifty. Uh, Less nifty would be the Hollywood representation of the first emperor in the film The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, which is, frankly, a bit dodgy. You may also have heard a few tidbits about the Terracotta Warriors on our spin-off children's podcast, Homeschool History, which you can listen to on BBC Sound. But the big question, of course, is who made the Terracotta Warriors and when and why and how and who found them? Well, let's find out, shall we? Julia, can we begin with the very basics? When we're talking about the Terracotta Army, we're talking about elements of the funeral complex belonging to Qing Shi Huangdi who's the first emperor of China. Who's this guy? How far ago are we talking? Well, the first emperor of China was born Ying Zheng in 259 BCE in the kingdom of Qin in what is now Gansu and Shanxi provinces. The northern half of what's now China was divided between a number of small estates which fought each other for control of land and resources. Now, by 259 BC, there were only seven of those states left on the field, of which Qin was the largest and the most successful. And it's thought that over the next 40 years, Qin wins out because it has the most thorough, the most controlling and ruthless state apparatus. And Ying Zheng succeeded to this throne in 246 BCE at the age of only 13. By the time he was 38, he'd conquered each of the other states and unified them for the first time into a single empire in 221 BCE. And at that point, he took the name Qin Shi Huangdi, or Great August First Emperor of Qin, as goes the literal translation. So at 13, he comes to the throne. By 38, he's conquered all of China. It's quite an achievement. I mean, I'm 39 and he's, you know, I feel like I've maybe not done anything with my life. Yeah. Which, what kingdoms have you unified, Greg? I've been mean to ask you this. 
I have unified the world of history and comedy into one perfect podcast <laughs> synergy. I mean, what, what have you unified, Phil? What's your best unification story? <laughs> um, what is my best unification story? Um, the other day, I had fried rice with leftover barbecue. South African borderwurst and fried rice. Mm, I don't think it should happen. But <laughs> some of these unifications are not right. <laughs> but I'm a boy king, and a boy king needs his empire. Um, <laughs> it's interesting hearing Chung Shu Huangdi because my that that name suddenly reignited all these memories of my father just being obsessed with Chung Shu Huangdi for a long time, and he yeah. was always re- he's, we'd read a lot about him and uh, and watch a lot of TV shows about him. He's quite a character, and we talk about him more in the, in the spin-off podcast we did, so Homeschool History, if it's only 13 minutes, it's on BBC Sounds. But the sort of the too-long-didn't-read version is that he unifies China through constant war, then consolidates power by introducing law codes, new coinage, standardised measurements, building roads, introducing writing uniform across the country, all sensible policies. And then he also forcibly relocates 700,000 people to be forced labourers to build his pet projects. He also burns books. Uh, he murders Confucian scholars by burying them alive. So less good policies. So he's quite a ruthless character. But all the while doing this, he's also busy juggling another huge engineering project in China. Do you want to guess what it is, Phil? Oh, might it be a wall? <laughs> Not just any wall. A pretty good wall? A very good wall. Is that what it's called? The very... Excellent Wall of China? (laughs) Something like that. It's on the tip of my tongue. (laughs) Absolutely. The very competently built Wall of China, otherwise known as the Great Wall of China. Yeah, that's one of his. So clearly we have an emperor who wants to make a big splash in life. He's building these huge monuments. He's introducing huge new policies. But he's also really wanting a glorious death. So how old do you think he was, Phil, when he started planning his own funeral? Oh, wow. Wow. Well, I mean, he became a king of 30. He's obviously an early starter. I'm going to say he started planning his own death at 14. <laughs> you are, you, I mean, you did a really good idea there of going 13, give it one year to plan. No, literally 13. He starts planning at 13. He's like, right. I'm the emperor and I'm going to die one day and I'm going to have the best death. That's foresight. Isn't it? I mean, I can't think of any plans I had at 13. Yeah. What were your I still feel, goals? I feel invincible now and I'm 32. I can't imagine being 13 and having the, the presence of mind to go, all right, you've had a good 13 years, but it's start time to start thinking about a will. <laughs> well, I just wanted at 13, what were your long-term oh. goals at 13? Actually, to be a professional wrestler. I really, I really wanted to be a professional wrestler <laughs> when I was 13. That was my equivalent of the Great Wall of China, was to become a professional lycra-clad man. What would your wrestling name be? Are you a bad guy or a good guy? I think I wanted to be called like the tyrant or something like that. So actually not completely <laughs> dissimilar from yeah. Chin Shu Huangdi, you know? All right. So you and uh, Chung Shu Huangdi are very similar in your outlook. But he's thinking about death. And this funerary complex, they start planning it when he's a teenager. And it's built in uh, Shanxi province uh, in uh, sort of central China, but at the time slightly off center, I suppose. And it ends up as being the biggest mausoleum in the history of the world as far as I know, and may never even be eclipsed because um, presumably Elon Musk just plans to live forever. Well, his mausoleum actually... will be in space. So oh, that's true. Chin that is true. will still yeah. hold on to the Earth title probably, right? <laughs> yeah. He'll be buried in a floating Tesla just orbiting around the moon or something. <laughs> 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 but actually, Chung Shia Wandi also is planning to live forever, Julia. How do you plan to live forever while simultaneously building your enormous tomb? With the first emperor, you have this strange combination of huge self-confidence and paranoid frailty. So on the one hand, he (laughs) proclaims himself first emperor of this unprecedentedly vast state. He is super controlling. He builds a government to micromanage ordinary people's daily lives. But on the other, from this surprisingly young age, he seems terrified of death by human or supernatural forces. So he was desperate to find an elixir to eternal life. And he believed this might be contained in cinnabar, an ore of mercury, which he ate a good deal of. Right. He died in 210 BCE, aged only 49. Ironically, probably, partly due to mercury poisoning. Okay. But we can see his tomb, this, this burial complex that he spends 
almost 40 years building as an insurance policy in case the whole Elixir thing didn't work out. So the first emperor died while touring the eastern part of his empire and his advisors initially decided to cover this up perhaps so they could manoeuvre the succession to suit themselves. So they pretended that the emperor was refusing to leave his carriage and to mask the stink of his corpse, which was busily rotting while they transported it back to his mausoleum, the Chin's former advisors filled his carriage with fish to cover up the smell. <laughs> wow, you, you know you smell bad when people are like, we've got to cover this up. Put a load of fish on him. that will be better. <laughs> I mean, they, he's died... And they're telling everyone, he's fine, he's fine, he just doesn't want to come out of his carriage. Also, he loves fish. I mean, it's such, a, it's such a weird plan. I don't understand it. But let's talk about the discovery of the terracotta warriors. Fragments were discovered, along with some bronze arrowheads, in a field by a family in 1974, Phil. They were family oh. uh, farmers. They were digging a well, and they stumbled on these little bits of broken terracotta and some arrowheads made of bronze and they thought oh that's that's nice and they sold it to a local trader and you know they didn't think anything more of it and then archaeologists went hang on a second and so they showed up and they were astonished by the terracotta warriors because they were not expecting them at all there is absolutely there's no evidence in any of the historical records there would be any terracotta warriors julie they thought maybe there would be a tomb but not the warriors can you tell us more yeah that that's right the existence of the tomb itself is described by Sima Qian, who's arguably the most famous of ancient Chinese historians, writing in about 100 BCE. But his history doesn't mention the warriors. I think that locals knew that the large mound nearby was an important tomb, but particularly in a pre-mechanical age, it was hard to break into the site, as well, of course, seeming a deeply inauspicious thing to do to break into somebody's tomb. So modern archaeologists were amazed by what these farmers found. It's arguably the most extraordinary archaeological discovery of the 20th century. I didn't realise it was so recent, the discovery. I thought it had been, it had been around longer than the 70s. Yeah, it's 1974, so it's... Um... I suppose that's part of the, the reason it's so iconic is that it happened in the sort of media age. So everyone can kind of go, oh, wow, look at these gorgeous images. It's also fitting that the, the mausoleum of an emperor obsessed with living forever came out around the same time as be the Bee Gees staying alive. <laughs> Do you think that's nice? <laughs> <laughs> I, think I think that everything oh, is connected, Phil. Everything it is. is <laughs> All cosmically connected. I think he must have heard staying alive and thought, this is my time to. to <laughs> he was just waiting for disco to reach its peak. And then he was like, I'm here. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so we've already heard, Phil, that the first emperor was pretty extra in his own life. How big do you think this mausoleum complex is when they started surveying it? And they're still working on it. Okay. We we all, people usually go by football fields, don't they? This is our <laughs> this is the SI unit for large spaces is uh, football fields. I'm going to say it's two football fields. Two football fields, Julia. Is it bigger than two football fields? The area that the mausoleum complex occupies below the ground is about 56 square kilometers. So the pits <laughs> containing the famous oh, no. terracotta warriors are only a small part of this complex. There's an artificial mound covering the emperor's tomb. So nowadays it looks like a forested pyramid about 65 metres high, 350 square metres at the base. And at the time of the emperor's death, this pyramid would have been surrounded by walls and covered with buildings where rituals and sacrifices would be performed for the well-being of the emperor after his death. And below ground, the tomb cavity was also surrounded by walls and by hundreds of other burial pits containing incredible things, of which the terracotta warrior pits are just a few. Yeah, Phil, you've said uh, two football pitches. Well, a football pitch is 0 0.005 kilometres squared. Right. This is 56 kilometres squared, uh, which is bigger than Oxford. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a, yeah, that's quite a good bit bigger. OK, fair enough. <laughs> when you're wrong, you're wrong. So we have the ancient Qin historian, Sima Tien, writing about 100 years after the tomb was built. And he described the complex like this. 
The tomb was filled with models of palaces and pavilions and offices, as well as fine vessels, precious stones and rarities. Artisans were ordered to fix up crossbows so that any thief breaking in would be shot. All the country's streams, the Yellow River and the Yangtze, were reproduced in quicksilver and by some mechanical means were made to flow into a miniature ocean. The heavenly constellations were shown above and the regions of the earth were shown below. The candles were made of whale oil to ensure their burning for the longest possible time. This is pure Hollywood stuff. This is booby traps and everything. Do you know what quicksilver is? Quicksilver, I'm not sure, but I bet Chung Shi Huang Di loved a pint or two of it. It sounds it sounds right up his street. You're absolutely right. He was drinking it because Quicksilver is basically mercury. It's rivers of mercury. Right, yeah, there you go. <laughs> this guy. He's built he's built rivers of mercury that mirror the rivers in China, and then he's got cross automatic crossbows and candles that burn forever. So it really is Indiana Jones. It's amazing. Were, were these things actually realised? Are they actually booby trap crossbows? Well, in the complex, we will get to that later. That is a good question, oh, and we'll leave okay. that dangling for now. Guarding this enormous complex and this particular pyramid tomb was, of course, these extraordinary terracotta warriors. How many soldiers were in there? How many terracotta soldiers, Phil, do you think were in this army? Um, well, if it's it's more than two football fields, so it's, it's more than <laughs> more than twenty two, more than forty four people. Is it like? 2,000 or something? Hey, that's a good guess. That is how many have been excavated so far. Ah, yes, okay. But we think there are 7,000 down there, Julia. Is that right? Yes, that is a working estimate. But there are also many other things down in the tomb complex. And it might be a good moment to explain a couple of ancient Chinese ideas about the afterlife. So, So through much of Chinese history... People want to be buried with items they think will guarantee them comfort and status in the afterlife, which could include servants and dependents like wives, as well as handy, desirable objects. So I guess underpinning this idea is the belief that the afterlife will be very similar to the mortal world. So whatever you wanted or needed here, you'll want and need in the next life too. Now, like several ancient states, early Chinese societies practiced human sacrifice. Here, the theory is that if servants and wives are killed and placed in the tomb, they'll go on the journey to the afterlife with the deceased and serve him there. But by the chin, you also have the idea that you don't always have to have real human corpses down there to revivify in the tomb. You can have high quality replicas and models, although the chin mausoleum also has evidence of some burial of humans, whether they were alive or dead at the time. But there's a huge range and richness of objects found in the emperor's burial complex. And these objects give us a good idea of what he himself saw as important. There's his army of bodyguards, plus hundreds of sets of armour, made of stone tiles. There are statues of stable boys, charioteers, chariots, horses, plus real-life hay and straw and skeletons of actual horses. There's a pit of terracotta officials, so you'll have bureaucrats to run your state in the afterlife, Mm. so there is still tax after death, I'm afraid. Yes, fine. (laughs) We we hear a lot about the terracotta warriors, but not enough about the terracotta accountants, the real heroes. (laughs) The afterlife isn't there. There's... Also an entertainment pit which contains terracotta acrobats, strongmen, musicians and life-size bronze birds. So an incredible cornucopia of things. It's interesting, the Chinese tradition of transferring objects into the afterlife, it still goes on now. So you're growing up in Malaysia, we'd, every year you go to sweep your sort of ancestors' graves. We tidy up, you clean up the graves and you burn offerings, you burn gifts fake cash you burn that and the idea is that when things burn they go up to heaven and they go to your grandparents and they can use them but it it updates as time goes by so now you can buy paper cars and burn those and the idea is that they go to heaven you your grandfather's got a, a new mercedes and now you can buy paper iphones and ipads oh wow which is a nice idea but it also kind of raises a question what is heaven like it doesn't sound much better <laughs> and the presumption is sort of you end up in heaven with sort of naked and with nothing 
it doesn't sound particularly pleasant. But also, uh, I can't imagine my grandparents being sent an iPad and knowing how to work it. <laughs> you have to burn the instructions as well. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this idea of the terracotta warriors being, as you said, Phil, they can sort of transform into soldiers in the afterlife. Also, potentially princes and concubines and maybe rivals to the throne who were <laughs> killed and, and chucked in there to get them out of the way. There is real straw and real hay for the real horses, which suggests perhaps humans and animals perhaps dying in this tomb, which is, is rather rather dark. But um, that's first emperors for you. But let's not dwell on the sad stuff, the macabre ends. Let's focus on these extraordinary terracotta people instead. So, Phil, we're going to show you an image from Pit 1. Oh. My favourite pit. <laughs> Everyone loves pit one. This is the first of four excavated zones. Can you describe what you can see for us? Basically, a, a long hangar structure filled with the terracotta warriors. And they're laid out very neatly in rows. And each row is separated by a low wall. And yes, there are many of them. And, and I can now see that two football fields was a wild underestimation. <laughs> Quite embarrassing, really. But there are lots of them, and and they're sort of in a sort of maze-like structure. Yeah, and uh, Julia, these are you know some of the two thousand terracotta warriors ex- excavated so far. Can you tell us a bit more about the three main pits where they've been discovered and, and what's in them? Sure. So the these three main pits are about a mile to the east of the tomb. So they represent the eastern frontier of the burial complex. So. Pit one, which is which is the biggest, has the main army, perhaps around six thousand soldiers, one hundred and sixty chariots, and the soldiers were all originally set out in almost forty single file lines. In front of them, there's an advance guard of archers, and I should point out that they were all armed to the teeth with battle-ready bronze weapons, so ready for combat. So real weapons? Yes, real bronze sharpened weapons. Then Pit 2 has a mix of cavalry, archers and war chariots. Pit 3 contains high-ranking officers, so it seems to be a command post. And as you say, there's also a fourth empty pit, and the fact that it was empty might be a sign that the site was unfinished when Qin Shi Huangdi suddenly died and had to be buried. Yeah, so maybe he was planning an even bigger army and he sort of unfortunately keeled over from his mercury lemonade drink. But the extraordinary thing about this, Phil, is it's incredible, but it also shows us battle formations. It shows us the kind of weapons and, and armour that these soldiers would have worn. I know you love Total War like I do, the, the video game. Is this immediately conjuring up a sort of strong feelings for you of, of commanding and controlling a little army? It really does. I, I actually got the impulse there to drag and select <laughs> a whole box of them and tell them to go somewhere. Uh, it also conjures up sort of the image, and this is, I guess this goes to speak of how little really changes over history. It reminds me of a military parade, like but some by that someone like Kim Jong-un or uh, Vladimir Putin might hold, just to show how powerful he is. It's the same thing, is really, isn't it? That's interesting, yeah. It's holding a military parade in the afterlife to show everyone what a big, what a big dog you are. Exactly that. I mean, Julia, what can we learn from the actual weaponry and, and stuff they're wearing? Yeah, quite, quite a lot. Well, the first thing it tells us is exactly as Phil surmised, that the Qin state, then empire, was an intensely militarised society. And that's why the Qin succeeded in destroying all the other states to found its unified empire. Every household had to supply an able-bodied male for the state's conscript army. And then strict army discipline made them ruthless fighters. So the army was divided into squads of five. If one man was lost from a squad, the others had to capture the head of an enemy. The terracotta figures enable us to visualise what this extraordinary army would have looked like. You've got the unarmoured rank and file at the front. Then you've got armoured fighters and archers distributed down the flanks. And yeah, they were armed with literally cutting edge bronze weapons. Finds in pit one included crossbow triggers, swords, lances, spears and over 40,000 arrowheads. So these weapons were clearly meant to be used. Analysis has shown that blades were sharpened and many are so well preserved that they'd still be lethal today. Wow. 
Oh, yeah. Over 2,000 years ago. That's good craftsmanship. Isn't it? And also that... It also goes to show just how much he believed this was real, right? It's how much he believed in the afterlife and that these things would transfer over. Because you don't commit something like this if, you, if it's just a hunch. <laughs> you know, Chung Shi Wandi clearly is a religious man. He's planning for the afterlife. He's fearful, perhaps. He's got this vast bodyguard, which is perhaps about showing off. But there must also be an element of him getting ready to transfer into a different religious state. I mean, the afterlife is presumably, as you said, it's a continuation of life in some ways. You take everything you need. But what is the religious cosmology of the Qin system at this time? The first emperor was indeed a deeply religious man in his way, even though he also boasted about boiling people alive. You can see this religiousness in the literal translation of the title he gave himself. So, Shi Huangdi, the first august thearch. So, he literally sees himself as a monarch of the gods. Emperor and Pope rolled into one. And when he founds his empire in 221 BCE, he immediately situates his dynasty within the magic cosmological belief system of the time, which is the five powers. And he declares that the Qin is ruling under the power of water. He builds himself a new palace. He names it after a heavenly pole to show how celestial and religious his power was. He went on tours across his new empire. He made sacrifices to spirits. He put up self-praising inscriptions on China's holy mountains. So in sum, you can see in religious terms, as in political terms, he had a robust sense of self-worth and he wanted to ensure that his next life would be every bit as grand as his first life had been. But this enormous army, is he expecting to have to fight his way into the afterlife? Or is this a an army for defending himself in the afterlife. So the first emperor was profoundly paranoid and controlling. On his journey to conquering China, he and his armies had killed hundreds of thousands of people from other states to the east of Qin. As you'll remember, the pits containing the terracotta warriors are on the eastern side of the tomb complex. And one interpretation is that Qin Shi Huangdi feared that his enemies in the afterlife, as in this world, would attack him from this direction. So this monumental army of bodyguards would protect him from the vengeance of all the many people he killed in this world. But I think we do need also to keep in mind that this site is so much more than the terracotta warriors. So if we go back to that incredible quotation from Sima Qian that you read earlier, We can surmise that the tomb itself contains palaces, contains wonderful objects, officials. It recreates out of Mercury the empire's rivers and seas, the features of Earth below and the stars above. So this is a whole universe being built underground. And the first emperor thinks he's going to be in charge forever. (laughs) And do we have any idea of how much of this was part of his 13-year-old death plan? And how much was just the ramblings of a mercury-poisoned madman in the (laughs) later stages of his life? I think on the one hand, you can already see in his ancestors a kind of tendency towards gigantomania (laughs) in tomb buildings, ever greater, more lavish mausoleums. But at the same time, there's nothing in previous Chin tombs which really serves as a precedent for the scale, the vastness, the complexity of the first emperor's tomb. It is assumed that there was a massive uptick in the ambition of his plans after he actually succeeded in unifying China in 221 BCE. So yeah, planning ahead when you're 13, yeah, get going on the mausoleum. But after he becomes emperor, it's on a it's on a different scale. So he becomes emperor at 38, he dies at 49. So, But maybe the last 11 years of his life, he's really ramping it up and going, okay, what I want now is rivers of mercury. Yeah. <laughs> also, as you enter into middle age, you become more obsessed with sort of small building projects don't you You build a conservatory you add an extension and so for Chen Shi Huangdi it was uh, another battalion I'll just get another battalion I'll put another battalion in the summer it's a midlife crisis Uh, 
Yeah, that's the, that's the question. Did he have to get planning permission for <laughs> this complex? That must have been a nightmare. <laughs> I think, luckily for him, he was the planning officer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Phil, we've already touched on this slightly, but um, what do you think archaeologists have found in the personal burial chamber, the pyramid of the first emperor himself? A cooler full of bottles of mercury for the big guy. <laughs> I imagine sort of cre- creature comforts, mm-hmm. food and wine and things like that. Maybe a rug, a nice rug. Mm-hmm. Quite sort of homely. Yeah, know. if this is like his private chambers, you know, maybe a couple of friends, a couple of pals. <laughs> oh, concubines. Do we have like, a, yeah? Well, I mean, kind of thing. We've actually sort of uh, lured you into a trap there because actually we don't know what is in his private chambers. It hasn't been opened. Julia, they found it in 1974. It's clearly the most exciting bit of the the site, surely. Why haven't we thrown a drone in there with a camera on it to have a little look? Why why can't we open it? There are a few reasons. For one, there are concerns for the safety of excavators. A survey discovered very high levels of, surprise, mercury Ah. in the tomb. (laughs) There are underground walls with a void in the centre of the site, probably for the the tomb of the emperor himself. So all that that survey information tantalisingly validates Sima Chen's remarkable description, but it also generates concerns about the stability of the site. But I think the biggest concern is for conservation. When the terracotta warriors were first brought out of the ground, they were brightly painted, but within minutes the colours faded after they were exposed to the air. And I think archaeologists' main worry is that they've they've already waited this long and no one wants to have it on their head that they said, yep, let's open this remarkable site, and then the contents just go to hell. They're they're ruined in minutes. It's a lot of pressure, Phil, isn't it? Can you imagine being the person who opens that tomb, and within minutes, everything just fades? It would be pretty awkward. You'd have to take a photo real quick. So I imagine how special it must have felt to see the the Terracotta Warriors in colour, live in colour. (laughs) That's amazing. I didn't didn't, didn't realise they they had colour on them. I guess they would have done. Yeah. So that oxidization process happens so fast. So the idea of opening the tomb sounds a dangerous because I mean there's booby traps too, right? Sima Tien tells us there's there's crossbows that fire at you. Are there are there no modern tools that can be used to sort of map or have have a peek in a non intrusive look into into the chamber with sonar or something like yeah, this? Yeah, lidar. Yeah, I mean I think they're they're trying, aren't they, Julia? But yeah, I think the surveys which I just mentioned are the most extensive that they have done. I think also it's just a very well fortified complex underground. These very, very thick, deep, tall walls. So there's a limit to the the depth and the distance that these surveys can travel given what seems to be the obstacles underground. And so is the idea that in this chamber would be the actual remains of Qin Shi Huangdi himself? That's exactly right, yes. Right, right, wow. Plus the recreation of the empire, you know, the rivers in Mercury and the stars and the landmarks and so on and so forth. So we have this extraordinary mausoleum complex. It's enormous. So we've got the 6,000 soldiers, another 1,000 different objects as well. So 7,000, we think, terracotta things, including, I mean, grooms, stable boys, painted bronze chariots with silver fittings, terracotta charioteers, terracotta horses, real-life hay and straw, scribes, bureaucrats, uh, acrobats, strongmen, bronze. I mean, it's extraordinary. You've got birds in there, animals in clay coffins. Incredible. But we want to now turn to... (laughs) Who made all this stuff, Phil? That's the next bit of the podcast. Because yeah. you can't buy this stuff on eBay. It's, this has to be crafted by someone. They don't have Alibaba yet. Not yet. But it, if it's taken that many years to excavate only 2,000 of the warriors, and there's still maybe another 4,000 warriors or 5,000 objects still in there, how on earth did they build this 2,000 years ago? Who's building it? Yeah, it's a genuinely monumental undertaking. So we know from early written histories that more than 700,000 conscripts from all over the empire are supposed to have been moved over to work on the mausoleum and also on the emperor's new capital nearby. 
So from what we know, the main burial chamber would have involved digging down to about 30 or 40 metres. You would have needed access ramps. You would have needed to divert watercourses. You need to build a huge perimeter wall, put loads of burial goods inside. Then, of course, cover it all over with a pyramid about 80 metres tall with yet more buildings on top of that. Then you need to add to this the manufacture and transport of all the goods involved. So creating pit one alone would have required the removal of over 70,000 cubic metres of earth. So that would fill around five and a half thousand lorries today. And it seems plausible that only a state like the Chin, which extracted conscript labour so rationally, but also so ruthlessly, could have seen this project through. Gosh, yeah, incredible. But imagine like not even believing in it, being the one guy who didn't believe in any of the afterlifes, just going, this is bullshit. <laughs> as, he's, <laughs> as he's carving his 500th statue, it's like, oh, no one's even going to see this. <laughs> I mean, Phil, you studied engineering at Cambridge. If we needed a replica made, would you be willing to project manage that for us? Oh, happily, yeah. A replica made of the whole complex, or yeah, ideally. Yeah. I mean, what what are your rates? I mean, let, let's talk budgets. I'll do I'll do for the exposure. To be honest, I'll just do for the exposure. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to have a plan B, eh, Phil? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. Fine. Well, that's that's very kind of you. So I, it's good to have you aboard. But I mean, Julia, this is an astonishingly enormous project. Seven hundred thousand conscripted labourers. And we have the pit in which they are buried too, the workers. And, you know, this is where we get into some of the sort of the sadder aspects is, you know, scientifically DNA analysis, skeletal analysis allows us to sort of see the kind of lives they led and the the kind of pressures they were put under to make this incredible site. Can you give us some sobering insights into the working conditions for this labour force? Sure. There are mass graves about 300 metres to the west of the first emperor's tomb. Alongside the skeletons, archaeologists have found fragments of pottery, which tell us perhaps a surprising amount about these unfortunate people, such as things like where they came from, if they were serving out a penal sentence, what their crime had been. But as you say, these graves are very eerie, grim aspect to the site. The bones which were discovered in the graves, some of them were thickened with evidence of arthritis, others had fractures or showed bone adaptation to intense use of muscles. So this suggests that these people were engaged in heavy labour before death. Workers don't seem to have been buried formally, they seem to have been thrown into a deep mass grave So the evidence strongly suggests that these workers were ill-treated and little valued in life. As I say, a fair number were probably doing forced labour as part of criminal sentences for relatively minor crimes. And a sinister aspect to this, I think, is the secrecy surrounding the site. The fact that the memory of the terracotta warriors never appeared on the historical record. So this suggests that the workers may simply have been killed at the end of the work when the emperor was interred to keep the site secret and sacrosanct. And the final kicker to all this is that as the emperor seemed to have believed that if he buried people in his tomb, they would serve him in the afterlife, perhaps he also assumed that the remains of these poor people would would just reanimate to be his workmen for eternity. It's pretty brutal. And there's even evidence potentially of instruments of torture found in some of these pits as well. So Yes, there's irons which are thought to have been leg manacles and so on. Yeah, okay. So they're they're being cruelly treated. And would a large portion of this workforce been taken from the peoples of the conquered kingdoms, or was it just everyone in the kingdom, whether they were Chin or conquered? So the DNA analysis of these bones suggests that they came from many different parts of the territory. So I think they could have been prisoners of war. But the Chin legal system was very tough, very ruthless. So it didn't matter what status you were, what ethnicity you were within the original Chin state too. 
Okay, so the labourers building the site are having a horrible time, and there's an enormous number of them. But can we now move on to the skilled artisans and talk more about the kind of the, the sculpture, the craft that goes into making these? Phil, we're going to show you another photo. What do you see when we show you some of the faces of the terracotta warriors? So this is a photograph, a close-up of about 12 soldiers or so, and they've all got the same uniform, they're all wearing the same armour, but they are all distinct. They've all got... They have all got their own face. They've even got their own sort of posture, and they seem to be of different ages. There's a couple of guys look about in their middle age. Some of them look like they're in, the, in their twenties. I mean, the, everyone's complexion is fantastic. I have to say, <laughs> um, but yeah, they all do seem to be unique. They all seem to be unique, very alive people. So, Julia, Phil has identified that their faces look unique. Is their composition completely unique? Are they coming out of moulds? How are they made? Is it a mix and match approach? How do you make a terracotta warrior? It seems that the larger parts of the figures were done by less skilled labourers. So local clay from the soil was pressed into moulds to make torsos, limbs, hands, heads and so on. There are moulds for the heads, aren't there? Was it eight moulds? Yes, but the individuality of the faces suggests that they were completed by skilled artisans who'd shape by hand facial details such as eyebrows, ears, beards and hairstyles like plaits and top knots and chignons and so on. Yeah, it's a bit like uh, when you get to invent a video game character. I was just thinking that. I was just thinking (laughs) I'm playing Skyrim and I pick a head and pick a... I always make them so ugly. I always turn up so ugly in the end. So I'm really (laughs) impressed by these guys because... They're quite good looking, actually, uh, the soldiers. <laughs> if you don't mind me saying, do we know if they were maybe based on real people or were these faces just made up? Sort of, were they? It's a great question. Inspired by real people around the place. We don't know. I think we can surmise that. But yeah, one of the challenges of making sense of these statues is that there is so relatively little human figurative sculpture before Mm. so they're a really fascinating milestone almost out of the blue when you think of chinese art you don't really yeah you don't really think of sculpture do you think of the sort of paintings and scrolls and manuscripts and there's very little statue and very little statue of normal people if there is a statue it's of some a god or a mythical creature or something and julia you mentioned quality control phil how do you think overseers could identify and punish any craftsman who wasn't hitting the standards a bad review on yelp (laughs) <laughs> one, star. one star for Xiaoming. <laughs> and, uh, how would they judge? Would they give it a little knock? Every time my dad enters a building, he starts knocking the walls and nodding. I don't know what he's checking for, but I imagine it's something like that. Tap, tap, tap. They all look pretty good to me. Let's be honest. They do look pretty impressive. I can't, I can't imagine um, seeing one of those going, not good enough. Julia, we know... We know a huge amount about the process because of inscriptions on the actual sculptures themselves that tell us who made them and who was their overseer, right? Yeah, so quality control was a little bit more systematic than Phil's dad, I think. No (laughs) offence to Phil's dad. Yeah, production seems to be very tightly monitored. So just about every item owned by or made for the Chin State had to have a mark stamped on it. And it would be archived in a register, which clerks would double check against the contents of warehouses. So it's another emblem of how controlling, how disciplined the state is. Most of the weapons in the tomb were inscribed with date of manufacture, plus the name of the craftsman who made them, and then the official responsible for that craftsman and so on and so forth in a long line of accountability that in some cases went all the way up to the prime minister of the empire. So if something was judged subpar, the person or persons responsible could be nabbed. This doubtless led to extraordinary standardization. So all the arrows had to be exactly 70 centimeters long, or if a trigger broke in a crossbow, it could be easily replaced with another because all the mechanisms were identical. So we have this sort of really really regulated workforce with this sort of chain of command going up the ladder so that you can you can chase down any imperfections phil and i mean julie you said you said the arrows are all exactly the same there are forty thousand arrowheads that were found in there all of them identical so 
it's kind of extraordinary. If I knew I'd done um, a bad job, I'd be quite tempted to write someone else's name on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Especially if I didn't like them. <laughs> I made someone with like th- I made one of them with three thumbs. I'd be like, this one was Jeff. Jeff did this. <laughs> I'm learning a lot about Phil in this program. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's the it's the chin era. You got to survive. You know. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't give you this project management job, Phil, because it sounds like you're going to cut some corners and, uh, and throw other people under the bus. Although, to be honest, by the sounds of it, a lot of people died on this project, regardless of how incredible the work is. I mean, it, there's some really grim elements to it, as well as this extraordinary craft and artistic achievement. On the one hand, you want to celebrate it and go, wow. And on the other hand, every wonder of the ancient world has behind it this huge death toll. Because, I mean, there's a reason these things didn't abound, that they were rare. It's just that the amount of human sacrifice they required, right? I think also the human personality required to devise this project, to have the ego to push it through, is hopefully also relatively seldom seen (laughs) in human history. It's a form of egotism so destructive of human life. Yeah, I mean, classic 13-year-old boy saying, right, when I'm king, I'm going to make everyone build me a tomb. And then he follows through on it. You think, oh, no. Is it still being excavated now, just ongoing? Every day or two, there's another terracotta warrior emerging? Exactly. There's still so much, even from those peripheral pits to be reconstructed, relatively few of the terracotta warriors emerged still complete and whole. Mm. Many of them were in fragments. So this is very, very painstaking work. And the fact that there's still so much to do, not just in terms of putting artifacts together, but analysing them for what they tell us about life uh, in the Chin, you know, 2,200 years ago, the fact there's still so much work to do, I think that really supports conservative archaeologists who don't want to take the risk of opening the main emperor's tomb. They say, you know, we, we've got enough to keep us busy here. You know, we, we, we don't need to do the fireworks of, 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 of opening the tomb itself. Lovely stuff. The nuance window! Well, um, that leads us really on to the nuance window. The nuance window is where Phil and I take a break and we play with our terracotta warriors and instead we <laughs> listen to Professor Julia and she takes uh, two uninterrupted minutes to tell us something we need to know about the terracotta warriors, the tomb, the mausoleum and the wider archaeology. So uh, I get my stopwatch up now and without much further ado, Professor Julia, do you want to give us the nuance window, please? The First Emperor's Tomb Complex seems to tell us a very clear, confident story of a man who proclaimed himself the first emperor of everything, who felt entitled to disrupt and often end the lives of millions of people to fulfil his own plans. If we view this site out of its broader historical cultural context, we might see it as a swaggering endorsement of the power of the ancient Chinese state under a centralised autocrat. But we're missing a big part of this cultural and political story if we don't say something about how ambivalent and even negative perceptions of the first emperor and his massive building projects have often been through Chinese history since. Although the first emperor undertook monumental building projects during his lifetime and proclaimed himself the first of a dynasty that would last 10,000 emperors, The Qin Empire actually collapsed only a few years after his death in 206 BC. And some historians argue the stresses that building the emperor's mausoleum and border wall placed on ordinary people led directly to the eruption of civil war so soon after the first emperor exited the scene. There are certainly many folk songs and tales complaining about the terrible sufferings of ordinary people from the state's demands. The Qin successors, the Han dynasty, very much wanted to put distance between their regime and his. They claimed the moral high ground. They said that they, by contrast, would be humane, virtuous rulers, that they'd win hearts and minds. And that critical view of the first emperor is very persistent through Chinese history, even though for the Han and other successor dynasties, this is a little hypocritical because they actually end up adopting the centralising policies of the Qin. They inherit the Qin's government structures. And of course, they subscribe to the Qin's vision of a unified Chinese empire. 
So in the two millennia that have passed since the Qin, the first emperor is something of an awkward origin story for China. He's a founder, an innovator, but also a ruthless tyrant. Wow, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Phil, what do you think of that? Yeah, loved it. Great. And um, as you say at the end, there are a lot of echoes of Qin Shi Huangdi in, I would say, 20th century Chinese history. You know, especially with the People's Revolution, the unification at a great cost. So, Phil, can you guess of 20th century Chinese rulers who was a paid up admirer of Qin Shi Huangdi? I'm going to guess the big man himself, Mao. Correct. Yeah. I have to ask this question, Julia, and I'm wincing in advance of it because this is one of my my dread questions. But there is a very strange thing in the modern world where people think ancient monuments were built by aliens. And with the pyramids, we get it. We get it with Indiana Jones movies and all sorts of things. Do we get it with Chinese archaeology? Is there any sense that some crazy conspiracy theory that the tomb of the first emperor is too complicated to have been built by humans? Ergo, aliens did it. A few months ago, I I watched a TV presentation by a Chinese archaeologist who reassured his audiences with regard to the whole archaeological monuments made by aliens theory that this definitely didn't happen in China ever. Because as anyone who's watched any Hollywood films know, aliens only ever land in the United States. (laughs) Nonetheless, I'm afraid that alien conspiracy theories about the first emperor's tomb and about a few other archaeological sites besides do circulate on the Chinese internet. They mainly relate to archaeologists' refusal to excavate the mound. So they're asking, what's the real reason for this? So parts of cyberspace respond that it's nothing to do with safety or conservation. It's a deep state conspiracy. So the the theory goes that the Chinese government knows that only aliens could have built a site like this and that the extraterrestrials are buried deep inside the tomb, maybe or maybe not in the form of poisonously smelly monster bats. And the government just doesn't (laughs) want the story. (laughs) <laughs> yep, monster bats. And the government just doesn't want the story to get out. But I must underline here, reporting this theory does not imply endorsement or credulity. Yes, it's the bloody internet again, isn't it? Honestly, monster bats. Jesus. Okay, all right. I guess well, it would be I'm... bats if it's underground and dark. So <laughs> there's a method to this madness, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Smelly. As long as they're listening to the Bee Gees, that's that, that's the only thing that I, I'm clinging to. Phil is your idea that in there, Chung Shi Huangdi and his monster bats are listening to Night Fever. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you know now? So it's time now for the So What Do You Know Now? This is our quick fire quiz for our comedian Phil to see how much he has learned. I always forget that this is coming up. <laughs> and and I get to this point and go, oh, why didn't I just pay? Why didn't I pay more attention? I, I don't know how I always forget this is a quiz at the end. Okay, You say that, but you have an impressive average score of 9.5 out of 10. That is your average score. Okay. You've got 10 questions. Uh, I'm going to start the clock now. Here we go. Question one. The terracotta army was buried with which ruler who unified China? Qin Shi Huangdi. Very good. Question two. Who discovered the terracotta army in 1974? Oh, it was some a family of farmers. It was. They were looking, yes. uh, they were digging a well and they stumbled on some terracotta shards and some bronze arrowheads. Question three. How many of the terracotta figures have been excavated so far? 2,000 so far. But it is people, 2000. but there may be as many as 7,000. Oh, you're good at this. Question four. (laughs) Name three of the things found in the funeral complex of Chen Shi Huangdi. Horses. Yep. uh, Weapons that are still usable now. And acrobats. Yes, very good. Question five. In the First Emperor's funerary complex, there are also rivers originally made with what dangerous liquid? Mercury, a.k.a. Quicksilver. Both are very good. Honestly, you're giving both me barrels. so many. Both barrels, fantastic options. Question six. The warriors are equipped with sharpened weapons made from which metal? <gasps> Copper. Brass. Bronze. Bronze! <laughs> ah! Copper is in bronze. Uh, I'm just trying, just trying to think. Bro, I I, I mean, what I had was br- I had BR. I had BR in my head. I'm going to give you half a mark because copper is in bronze. So, okay, okay uh, half a mark for that. Question seven. Roughly how many arrowheads were found on the site in pit one? Oh, Lord, was this... Oh, no. 600. 
<laughs> it was 40,000. Oh, no. <laughs> Question eight. Each terracotta warrior bears an inscription of what? The name of the person who made it and their overseer. Yeah, absolutely. Question nine. Each warrior appears to have a unique face and pose, but how many moulds were used for the heads? There were eight moulds. There were, yeah, absolutely. And this for eight and a half out of ten, which is a very strong score. Why haven't archaeologists entered the actual private resting tomb of Ching Shi Huangdi? For safety concerns. And, and it's or mercury aliens. and booby traps <laughs> and aliens and a big yeah. am- a cavity under the fl- uh, in the wall or floor. Uh, cavities. It's bad for your teeth. <laughs> I will give you that. Eight and a half out of ten. Very strong score. Well done, Phil. I'm so sorry about the arrowhead answer. When I said 600, Julia audibly winced. So I I feel like I really hurt her feelings there. (laughs) Eight and a half out of ten is very good. And listener, if you fancy more of Phil, then you can check out our episodes on the bodacious Borgia family from Renaissance Rome. Or if you want more Chinese history, you can sail on over to our episode on Chung Yi Sao, the pirate queen. She was quite the lady. Our whole back catalogue is available on BBC Sounds. And remember, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review, share the show with your friends, make sure to subscribe to You're Dead to Me on BBC Sounds so you never miss an episode. But it's time now for me to say a huge thank you to my guests. In History Corner, we had the wonderful Professor Julia Lovell from Birkbeck University of London. Thank you, Julia. Thanks so much. And in Comedy Corner, we had the fantastic Phil Wang. Cheers, Phil. Thank you for having me. Such a good time. And to you, lovely listener, join me next time as we unearth another treasure trove of trivia from a different chunk of global history. But for now, I'm off to go and start building my own mausoleum. Bye! You're Dead to Me was a production by The Athletic for BBC Radio 4. This episode was written and produced by M.N. Nagus and me, with additional writing by John Mason. The research was by John Mason. The assistant producer was Emmy Rose Price Goodfellow. The project managers were Cypher Mio and Isla Matthews. And the audio producer was Abby Patterson. Hello, fans of your Dead to Me. I'm Lucy Worsley, and I'd like to tell you about my Radio 4 series, Lady Killers. When a woman commits murder, it's always a sensation. Murders committed by women in the Victorian era were no different, and I'm joined by a crack team of female detectives to take a look at these historical crimes from a modern feminist perspective. You can listen to the whole series by searching for Lady Killers on BBC Sounds.